Welcome to the Arrow Lecture, which is organized by SIPA Center for Global Economic Governance, the Department of Economics Program for Economic Research, and Columbia University Press. Um, my name is Jose Schenkman, and it's an enormous pleasure to introduce my longtime friend and co-author David Krebs, the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management Emeritus at Stanford Graduate School of Business, today's Arrows Lecture. Um, I want to congratulate the, the selection committee, Harrison Hong, Mike Woodford, Patrick Bolton, and Miles Thompson, and Jens Sveiner for selecting Dave. Without question, one of the most accomplished economic theorists of our generation. And our generation wasn't bad, I have to say. No. <laughs> um, Dave may, has made path-breaking contributions in many areas, but in particular to game theory, decision theory, and asset pricing. In game theory, his contributions include pioneering work in the, on the role of incomplete information, the definition of sequential equilibrium with Bob Wilson, who is arguably the most widely used refinement of the Nash equilibrium. And his papers with Fudenberg, with Drew Fudenberg, who inspired much of the modern work on learning in games. Those guys define what people do in that area. Now, Krebs made fundamental contributions to the decision theory under uncertainty. His paper is about preference for flexibility was the first to present axioms for preferences over choice sets. That has had a, a lot of impact, but in particular, it is the cornerstone on recent literature that provides axiomatic characterization of behavioral phenomena, such as the preference to avoid temptation. Closely related to that other work was Krebs' paper with Porteus, that it is serves today as the foundation for dynamic economic models that try to distinguish the role between the role of intertemporal substitution on one hand and risk aversion. Uh, the Krebs Porteous research has had huge impact in what is called today ma macro finance, you know, the, the mix of macro and finance, and more recently, too, in much of the work in, in climate finance. With Mike Harrison, Krebs laid the rigorous theoretical foundation for models of efficient financial markets in which investors require compensation for being exposed to systematic risk. The paper made me and I think the whole profession finally understand what lay behind the Black-Scholes equation. So that was also a very big contribution. It is remarkable that such a highly technical paper has accumulating more than 5,500 Google sites. In another paper with Mike Harrison, Krebs laid the foundation for models of speculation with diverse beliefs. A theme I picked up in my own work and in particular my Arrow lecture uh, on financial market bubbles in 2010. Of course, Dave has deserved and received many, many academic honors. I would here just cite two. I told him I, spent, I prefer to spend time on his work than his rewards. But of course, we have to mention the John Bates Clark Medal. And also, Dave was a co winner of the 2018 Cardi Award for the Eventual Science given by the National Academy of Sciences every two years since 1961. So every two years, uh, uh, it's given for noteworthy and distinguished accomplishment in any field of science within the Charter of the Economy Academy. In fact, if you look at the list of winners since 1961, the year Dave and his, and his, and his co-wardees won was the only time economists received that reward. It was the first time the Academy gave to economists. And we're all very proud, all the economists who are members of the Academy are very proud that David Krebs, Paul Milgram, and Bob Wilson shared that award. Today, Dave will speak on a, on a topic connected to another of his longtime academic interest, uh, the human resource management. So welcome, Dave. And by the way, let me tell you this. I've heard many talks by Dave, and they're always spectacular. So you're in for a treat. Okay, so thank you, Jose. Um, 
I'm going to talk today, uh, the title of the talk is Not Every Couple Should Have a Prenup, How the Context of Exchange and Experiences Affect Personal Preferences. Uh, I, by the way, I gather that Harrison circulated both the draft of the book that will eventually appear and the uh, slides to a large number of people. So I'm not quite sure why you're here. You've already seen it, but if you want to see the experience of the talk, that's fine. Um, but what does this title mean? Why not every couple should have a prenup? Well, this is a play on a column that Gary Becker wrote in Business Week 40 years ago, something like that which was originally titled Why Every Married Couple Should Sign a Contract. Now, if you're interested in reading what Gary wrote, uh, if you go and search on Gary Becker prenups or Gary Becker contract, you're led to the Hoover Digest, which reprinted it and has it on the web under the title, Do You Swear to Love, Honor, and Cherish, and Sign Here. So what is Becker saying? He says, OK. Economics is based on the following things. Behavior in economics is based on the following things. Individuals face constraints. Individuals have beliefs about states of nature. Individuals have tastes and preferences, utility functions, things like that. Again, what is the argument that uh, Gary Becker gives? It says you fix beliefs, you fix tastes and preferences. Why not design the constraints facing the two individuals in a marriage so that it reflects their particular beliefs and preferences. One size uh, fits all divorce law is not ideal. Let's make an ideal contract for them, perfectly sensible economics. Uh, now, Gary deals with the fact that beliefs are not really fixed. If you went to your betrothed and you said, let's have a contract, perhaps he or she will draw some adverse inferences from that. So Becker understands this, and his argument is, well, we can control for this by having every couple be required by law to make a contract. Then the adverse inferences goes away. Uh, this ignores a rather large and well-developed literature on signaling. If the custom in society is that you just sign a boilerplate contract, trying to go beyond that boilerplate contract is going to cause suspicions to arise. Uh, there are societies, uh, if you get married in Israel in a Jewish wedding, you have to have a marriage contract called a ketubah. Um, I was looking for my ketubah. Well, I married in, got married in Israel, couldn't find it, which is, just shows you how significant this contract this is. Um, but let me tell you, it's entirely boilerplate. I mean, the contract was presented to me. It's a contract between me and the bride's father. It was presented to me and said, sign here and put a number there, and that was it. So it was not uh, boilerplate. If the equilibrium is everybody does boilerplate, then Gary's wrong. Anybody who wants to go around that, have a special contract, it's going to signal something, and you have to worry what that is. But let's ignore that issue. Uh, suppose that adverse implications are not drawn from wanting to have a specialized contract. That's also a possible equilibrium. Then Becker goes on to give his argument that says, let's fine tune the constraints to fit the preferences of the individual. And the questions that you need to ask are, are the preferences fixed? Will the presence of a contract affect the preferences of the people involved? Will the presence of a contract affect how the preferences evolve over the course of the marriage? Now, in economics, a little bit of Latin that economists like to quote is, the gustibus non disputandum est. There's no arguing about tastes. People have preferences. People have a utility function. It's implicit in their genes. It doesn't change over time. It's what guides their behavior. We just don't discuss in economics about where the tastes come from or about how they change given context. That's the standard orthodox way of thinking about preferences. There are exceptions in the literature. Um, there's a literature uh, by started by uh, Strutz, then Yari, Golan Pessendorfer, they talk about cases where you know your later preferences are going to change, you don't like the change, so you constrain yourself. Uh, Jose mentioned I have a paper which begins to talk about preference for flexibility, which is a different story. The story there is I don't know what my preferences will be later on. I want to give myself the flexibility to make choices later on. So that's a literature which is an exception to De Gustavus. Uh, there's a budding, you know, beginning to be part of flourishing literature in behavioral economics, having to do with timing consistency for discount rates, things like that. That fits in the general category. 
And mostly direct, most directly for today's talk, there are heterodox or call, so-called heterodox economists who have written about the impact of context on behavior. And in my opinion, this is some of the very best behavioral economics there is, um, some references forthcoming. Now, let's remember why we're here. There's um, uh, the guy, Kenneth Arrow. Uh, Joe said I should connect my work to the, or to suggest what I'm talking about to the work of Ken. So I'm gonna say there are two connections. First of all, the standard model of choice in economics starts with choice, goes to preferences, goes to utility. It is all based on Arrow's coherent choice axiom. There's the axiom. Uh, I won't even bother to read this. Uh, you've probably seen the choice, the coherent choice axiom before. But if you have that axiom and a technical condition, finite, not emptiness, everybody makes choices out of a non-empty set uh, or finite, non-empty set, you get complete and transitive preferences. That's all it takes. And if you have a complete and transitive preferences and some technical restrictions, you get utility maximization. So that really is, that axiom is the basis for our standard model of choice preference maximization or utility maximization in economics. What does it rule out? Well, it rules out the following. Guy walks into a restaurant or a diner says, I want a piece of pie and a cup of coffee, please. Person behind the counter says, we have apple and peach pie today. Bring me a piece of apple pie. Person behind the counter says, I just remembered, we have one slice of banana cream left as well. You also have banana cream? Well, in that case, bring me a slice of peach pie. Okay, that's not allowed, right? He chose out of apple and peach. Apple, in largest choice set, he can't suddenly switch over to peach. Now, people perhaps, by and large, don't act in this fashion. And when I say perhaps, by and large, you know, there's a lot of literature. Um, uh, Mike Woodford, I think, was telling me about some examples where the people don't act in this fashion. But in the context of selecting a variety of pie to have with your coffee, maybe it's a good enough modeling assumption. But when you get to choices that apply to a lifetime of choices, what education to get today, what jobs to take next year, what jobs to move to five years from now, how confident are we that people will not change what they, that they prefer based on the opportunity sets that they have? Or instead, why are we confident that this applies? Well, I'm not confident at all. The point here is that the connection to what uh, Ken Arrow did is he gave us the formal way to think about these questions, about how choices evolve through time. And that's why we have formal mathematical theory. So that brings me to the theme of this talk. Since the Second World War, mathematical economics or mainstream economics has been made mathematical. Uh, Gerard de Bruy, I think it was his AEA presidential lecture, maybe his Nobel Prize lecture, he talks about the mathematization of economics. There was mathematics and economics before the Second World War. But since the Second World War, it's become the way to do economics by and large. Wave number one was choice theory formalized, including uh, the work of Arrow, price theory, general equilibrium, more things that uh, Kenneth contributed to. That was you know, from 1950 until 1970. In that literature, beliefs are pretty much fixed. Wave number two, starting with the uh, work of uh, George Akerlof, uh, Professor Stiglitz with Mike Rothschild, Michael Spence, we started having information economics. There you start getting serious about the formation of beliefs. Where do beliefs come from, especially beliefs about what other people are going to do, how they're gonna react to things that you do? Well, I think it's time for wave number three. You wanna get serious about preferences, how they're determined and how they evolve through time. We've taken care of you know, the, the, the basics, We've taken care of beliefs. Now let's talk about preferences. Now in this talk, I'm a commentator. I'm not an originator. Uh, there are individuals sometimes labeled as heterodox economists who live on the boundaries between economics and social psychology who have been beating this drum pretty hard uh, over the years. Um, wonderful book by George Akerlof and Rachel Crampton, Identity Economics. Another book by Sam Bowles, The Moral Economy. Uh, by the way, thank you to Suresh for pointing me in the direction of uh, Sam's book, which I did not know about. I'm sure there are others out there and I'd be grateful to learn of them. And just today, uh, Joe tells me he's writing, co-authoring a book on this general topic about how culture changes preferences. Very good. Maybe I don't have to beat this drum quite as hard. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to beat the drum for this in a few systematic ways. 
I'm going to do so in the context of some simple mathematical models, basically of agency theory. So it's not just writing down a bunch of words, but actually getting some numbers out. And in the end, I want to discuss the question, is this good for the soul of economics? Big bunch of small type. It's a big topic. I'm writing a book about this, which will be published, I hope, by Columbia University Press, if they find it acceptable. Uh, a, if you're interested in this topic after I'm done, send me an email, creps at stanford.edu, very simple. And when I get the full draft done, I'll be happy to send out copies. Okay, second connection to Ken Arrow, was Kenneth actually a heterodox? You know, Kenneth did almost everything. And here's an example. He wrote a paper called Gifts and Exchanges in the journal Philosophy and Public Policy, volume one, uh, where he enters the debate about paying for blood donations in that he talks about what motivates people to give gifts. Uh, it's very connected to what I'm gonna say. And uh, having never heard of this paper, did a little bit of a, a Google search and I found the paper. It's a paper of Ken's that deserves a lot more attention and renown. It's a really interesting paper. So I recommend this paper if you're looking for very early work on this topic. Okay, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna present a couple of models. Uh, I'm gonna use two familiar names. Professor Stiglitz in my own, all the details are changed to protect the innocent, if either one of us is innocent. So in this model, Joe calls me, says, would you like to come to Columbia to give the arrow lecture? I ponder, I'm a great admirer of Kenneth's, and despite the time and effort it would take, I really hate to travel, I would gain $20,000 worth of intrinsic benefits to do so, to be able to stand here and talk about this stuff I'd pay $20,000 to be able to do that. However, it's gonna take me time to prepare. It's gonna cost me $10,000 worth of effort just to do the preparation. Now, in addition to that $10,000, random circumstances are gonna pop up. COVID is gonna to begin to explode, perhaps. There are all sorts of things that could happen. There's gonna be additional costs in addition to the $10,000 in the amount of theta. I only get the $20,000 benefit if I show up here to give this talk. The first $10,000 is sunk. I learned theta, so the question is, am I willing to pay the additional theta to get myself to $20,000? And obviously the answer is only if theta is less than $20,000. Otherwise, you know, I'm a no-show. Probability distribution of theta is exponential with that wacky coefficient. Uh, but the reason for the wacky coefficient it is it means that I appear with probability 95%. So there's a 95% chance I'm gonna show up, 5% chance I'm a no-show. Uh, Joe understands all this. He gets a dollar value benefit of $10,000 if I show up, but he loses due to the embarrassment $20,000 if I'm a no-show. So he computes his expected utility or expected payoff. He's risk neutral. It's $8,500. His next best alternative gives him an expected payoff of $7,000, which is why he paid, he, phoned me up and said, do you want to come? My expected payoff turns out to be, this is a priori, $3,657.64. And the reason for this strange number is that you have to evaluate this interval, this integral, and the integral doesn't come out with a nice number. You can trust me though on the calculation. I'm going to accept Stiglitz's offer if my expected payoff, my total expected payoff is greater than zero, 3,657 is greater than zero, so I accept, I say, okay, you know, and then on the day when I realize what theta is, if it's bigger than $20,000, no show, if it's less than $20,000, here I am giving the talk. I'm not in deciding whether to take the, the you know, to accept Stiglitz's offer, uh, um, appoint, uh, appointment, uh, his invitation, I'm not taking into account the fact that he has concerns about whether I show up or not. So to motivate me, to show up, he can offer me an honorarium of H dollars if I show up, but I have to pay him a penalty P if I'm a no-show. These go into Joe's pocket. If I pay the penalty, it comes out of Joe's pocket if I pay the honorarium. Now in real life, it would be Columbia University that would pay any honorarium. By the way, there's no honorarium. Joe figured out what's coming up and he said, no, no honorarium, no penalty. Question is, can we induce a socially better outcome employing H and P. And the ghost of Gary Becker stands up and says, absolutely, you can. Standard economic reasoning, Joe and I in this model are risk neutral. 
we can exchange money. Easy theorem, the first best is available to us, the thing that maximizes social welfare. It turns out that by setting the sum of H and P to $30,000, you achieve the socially efficient point where how we split the social welfare, the total social, the optimal, so efficient social welfare, depends on how we split 30,000 between H and P. Bigger H, better for me. Bigger P, better for Joe. Uh, it turns out that if we go to the socially efficient outcome, where H plus P is $30,000, in order for Joe to want to participate, to want to do this, it, the penalty's got to be at least $27,000. Now, where, how do I know that H plus P has got to be $30,000? Why does P have to be greater or equal to 20? Believe me, the mathematics is trivial. It's just, you write down the stuff and it just falls right out. So here are some numbers that work. Scenario A is the baseline scenario. Uh, the B is my benefit, $20,000. H and P are initially zero. There's the probability that I appear. There's my payoff. There's Joe's and the sum of the payoffs. Scenario C says, okay, Joe's going to split the $30,000, the efficient H plus P, $27,000 penalty, $3,000 uh, honorarium for me. $27,000, by the way, remember, is that what it takes for Joe to want to do this? And you'll see that in Joe's payoff, it's exactly $7,000, his reservation utility. Probability that I appear, 0.99944. My payoff is $6,327. Point is, the sum of the payoffs, because we're efficient, goes up to $13,327. If we split between H and P, giving me a little bit less H and Joe a little bit more P. Same probability I appear. The probability that I appear just depends on the sum of H and P. Uh, my payoff goes down. Joe's go up, goes up. And if, scenario E, Joe wants, because he's the principal in this relationship, if he wants to extract all the surplus, the deal is, if I don't show up, I pay him $33,327. $33, if I do show up, I only have to pay him $3,327. In that case, my payoff is 57 cents. I couldn't quite drive these numbers to me all the way down to zero. And Joe gets all the social surplus. Okay, so and that's just saying what I just went through. Okay, that's the ghost of Gary Becker. Of course we can do better. Akerlof and Cranton come along and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you impose a penalty on Krebs, is that going to affect his perception of the character of the transaction? Transaction. Before, I'm doing this because I love Ken Arrow. He's a great hero of mine. Now, maybe I'm doing it because I don't want to have to pay Joe at least $27,000. And that may lower my intrinsic motivation to actually show up. If that's true, bad things can happen. Now, is that possible? The changing the character of a transaction changes people's intrinsic motivation. Well, a very famous paper, I'm sure everybody here has seen this paper by Nisi and Rustakini. There were Israeli daycare centers in the city of Haifa, I think it was, where the parents were showing up late to pick up their children. They go consult with the ghost of Gary Becker. He says, okay, you gotta provide them with more motivation to show up on time, impose a fine for showing up late. Whatever motivation they had before, now they've got more. Well, they imposed the fine, and the parents showed up even later on average. Akerlof and Cranton, Sam Bowles, others explain, you impose the fine, the centers have reframed the transaction for the parents. Before, it was a social obligation to be on time. The staff depends on you to do that. You're, you're socially obligated to do that. Afterwards, they've set a price for being late. It's an economic transaction. You decide how much it's going to cost me to hurry to pick up my kids. I'm willing to pay the price. I can show up as late as I want. The general meme in social psychology, extrinsic uh, rewards crowd out intrinsic motivation. Most famous debate on this subject was in England, 1970 or so, should blood donations be compensated monetarily? In England, you gave blood before, what you got was a biscuit and a cup of tea. Now the question is, should they pay money to get more blood donations? Very large public debate in Great Britain led by eminent sociologist Richard Titmus from the LSE. Titmus says all sorts of bad things will happen. And I mean, his list of things that were bad that are going to happen if you do this gets down to people won't trust the government anymore. I mean, it's, it's a very 
big bill of bad things. Uh, it was in the context of this debate that Arrow wrote Gifts and Exchanges, the paper I mentioned before. And um, Titmus's book is worth reading. It's a little bit hyperbolic, but uh, Ken's, uh, Ken's article, I think, introduces a little more rationality into exactly what might happen. There's some data about this. There was a uh, experimental studies done by Melstrom and Johansson. They had subjects come in, would you give blood? Group A, no compensation. Group B, you'd be paid some money for giving blood. Group C, you'd be paid the same amount of money, but you can immediately donate it to a charity. And what they found is for men, no effect. It didn't help donations amongst men. It didn't hurt donations among men. Men just gave the same amount of blood in all three cases. With women, group A gave, you know, whatever blood they gave. Group B, who were being paid and have to take the payment, gave less blood. Group C, where you, the women could donate the money, they went back up to what they had for group A. So that, you know, it, it's, it's, you're, again, reframing it by saying you can donate it. Well, now you're back to, you're doing, you know, good social things. Um, can it be explained by standard economics? A uh, number of authors have tried. Uh, the best example of this, I think, uh, the, the classiest article is by Benabu and Tirol in 2006. They say it's signal jamming. They say the reason you give blood is to try and convince people who are watching you give blood that you're really a high-minded, socially-minded person. If they're paying for blood, that signal is being jammed. It's no longer the case that giving blood signals that you're a high-minded person. It signals maybe you're a high-minded person, maybe you're doing it for the money. So now they say donations are going to go down. Their argument's a little bit tricky because what you need is if they have a payment, then socially minded people who you're trying to pretend you are no longer give blood. So it's, it's a little tricky, but Benabu and Tirol are very clever guys. The article really works. You know, there's no mistake in what they do. I just think it's silly. Um, I think, and I argue why in the book, it doesn't fit all the evidence. In particular, the uh, one of the original experiments about you know extrinsic motive, extrinsic uh, mo uh, compensation driving out intrinsic motivation, was talking about an experiment done on nursery school kids, and nursery school kids just aren't smart enough to figure out signal jamming. I'm sorry. Now you could say, well, nursery school kids, how relevant is that to what adults do? Okay, I think the simplest explanation is best, which is that. If you change the context of the transaction, if you make it a market transaction, you're going to lower the intrinsic motivation that the person has. So back to the model. If the imposition of a penalty dulls my intrinsic motivation, what are the implications? There you go. Scenario A is the base case. F and G and H and J say, what if imposing a penalty lowers Krebs's intrinsic motivation to 10,000, then to 13,666, 18,829, and then scenario J is 17,000. What happens is in scenario F, where it has my intrinsic motivation, social welfare just, you know, it's $3,300 instead of 12,157. And there's no way that Joe and I can come to a deal. You know, you have to have at least 7,000 on that bottom line before Joe and I can come to a deal which explains scenario G. Scenario G is if it falls more than 13,666, imposing a penalty, we can't come to a deal. At 13,666, if that's what my intrinsic motivation falls to, we can just make it work. I'm at zero, Joe's at 7,000. 18,829, that's the number below which the social surplus, the sum of the payoffs falls below what it is in the base case. And finally, you've got scenario J. Well, I'm going to hold scenario J for a moment. Okay. So why is this happening? Well, there are three real effects. First of all, if you impose H plus P, I'm going to show up more often. And that's good for Joe. Secondly, I have to pay the cost of showing up in additional states of nature. I'm showing up for larger thetas. They cost me more money. I got to pay for them. And insofar as it changes my intrinsic motivation term, you're destroying a source of value for the two of us. Now, you're destroying a source of value. It could be that the higher probability times the lower value is going to increase. But in fact, for scenarios F and G and H, those red numbers that you see in the table say that 
my expected enjoyment, my new intrinsic motivation times the probability that I show up all decline. And it's that destruction of value that is probably the most important of the three effects. Now, this doesn't mean that Joe will not impose in his own interest a penalty. I take the case, this is the final scenario. If B is $17,000, that's a number such that it's going to reduce the social surplus. But the only way Joe can capture some of my initial surplus is by making me show up more. And it turns out in that case, there's the base case. If Joe imposes a penalty of $30,000, and that only causes my intrinsic motivation to go down to $17,000. i am left with $329. Joe is up to $10,000. Joe has increased his payoff. He's decreased my payoff. He's decreased my payoff by more than he's increased his payoff. That's why the number in the final row goes down. But it's still good for Joe. And so Joe could want to do that. OK, that's the first model. Now, it's a pretty trivial model. And what I want to do, let's see, what am I doing on time? Oh, my God. Um, what I want to do is add a second dimension of performance by me. I have two things I have to do. I have to appear, and that's going to cost me effort. And I have to prepare a talk of high quality. Both Joe and I prefer a high quality talk, but that takes effort. And in true multitasking style, the more effort I put into showing up, the higher is the marginal cost of quality effort. So if I have to work harder to show up, I'm not going to show up with as good a talk. Now, in the book, there are going to be two models with the quality of the talk. I'm just going to skip over the first of these models. The first of the model, just let me say, first of the model mixes traditional uh, Holmstrom and Milgram's type multitasking with a new feature, which is this feature of it reduces my intrinsic motivation. And the bottom line, I can just do the bottom line, if the imposition of a penalty lowers my intrinsic motivation by a multiplicative factor, Joe is facing a double whammy by resorting to charging a penalty. He has to make up for the lower show up effort that I make because I have lower intrinsic incentive to show up. And he suffers the loss of my incentive to put in good quality. And he has no recourse for that. There's no way that he can motivate me to put in more quality. In this model, if you have a 3% reduction in my intrinsic motivation, it gives socially worse outcomes than H equals P equals zero. So uh, you impose a penalty, and the penalty's got to be pretty substantial to, to work for Joe. Uh, you know, 3% reduction, my intrinsic motivation, we're worse off. Second model is better because it gets rid of classic sort of multitasking stuff, very similar to the very first model I talked about. I see a state of the world. I decide whether I'm willing to show up, given what it's going to cost me, and I then decide how much effort to put into the quality of the talk. OK, if my efforts before observing theta are fixed and sunk, it turns out in the model, and you have to go look at all the algebra that goes with the model, that what happens is, after I see theta, the amount of effort I'm going to put into the talk, the quality of the talk, is just fixed as a function of theta. So it, it's, that gets rid of traditional multitasking issues. Uh, what happens, here are some numbers. Now, let me explain what the first row, which is row, is. That is, across the scenarios, by what percentage does my intrinsic motivation continue? Uh, you, scenario three, the number is 0.9. That means that in scenario three, when Joe imposes a penalty, it causes my intrinsic motivation to go down by 10%. Scenario four, it goes down by 20%. Scenario five, it goes down by 50%. What you see here is Joe imposes in scenario two, where it doesn't affect my intrinsic motivation, he imposes a penalty of $17,000. And then going down, it's sort of sliding. It's the less and less penalty, more and more for me. I'll explain why in a minute. Next line, probability that I appear. It was 0.95. It's still 0.95. The model is jiggered so that that's true. The probability that I show up in scenarios two, three, four, and five, where Joe imposes a penalty, the number is greater than 0.999976. Why is that? Well, this model is too complex to solve analytically. I got to use numerical integration to integrate the cost to me, the benefit to Joe of things. 
And I cut things off at theta equals, I think it was something like 74,100, uh, which the probability that theta is less than 74,100 is 0.99976. Uh, it turns out as once Joe is gonna impose a penalty, he wants me to appear in all states of nature. Why is that? It's because up to that level of theta, the $20,000 loss of faith that he suffers if I don't show up overwhelms everything else. And he just show up, Krebs, just do it. If I kept going with thetas, there's a theta big enough, I don't know, 10,000, a million, where all of a sudden Joe says, okay, never mind, don't come in that state of nature. Okay, average quality of the talk, even if my intrinsic motivation doesn't go down, as I'm showing up in higher theta states, the average quality of my talk goes down. But I'm more interested in scenarios three, four, and five. There, the average quality of the talk goes down and goes down and craters if I lose half my motivation to show up. My expected payoffs, well, I've set up the payoffs so that in scenarios three, four, and five, I'm basically at zero. So Joe is imposing the best penalty and honorarium he can to get all the social surplus for himself, modulo $27, $8, $15. Last row though tells the story. Uh, if it doesn't change my intrinsic motivation, scenario two, the total sum of payoffs, socially we're better off, okay? He's gotten me to come in more states. It's all worked out fine. However, in scenarios three, four, and five, you know, by imposing this penalty, by causing my intrinsic motivation to go down 10%, then 20, then 50%, social value just craters again. I mean, it's just very destructive of what works. Um, yeah, that's all saying this. What is the least reduction in my intrinsic motivation such that we do as well as in the base case? My intrinsic motivation has to be 95.5% of what it was originally. Anything less than that, the social payoffs go down. Okay, so that's, those are two models. Uh, I think these models are not just about me and Joe. They have wide applicability. Uh, there's a wide number of social favors that one person does for another. Bob asks Alice, drive me to the airport, help me on, you know, move my stuff, help me study for an economics test. Alice has a bunch of reasons why she might say yes. She likes to do social favors in general. She's a generous person. She likes to do these favors for Bob. She anticipates that Bob or Bob's friends will reciprocate in the future. Now, the third of those is extrinsic motivation. She's not doing it because she likes to. She's not doing it because she likes Bob. She's doing it because of the Benny she'll get in the future. Very powerful force. I don't dismiss it. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in number one and number two and the impact of things like penalties that will have on explanations number one and two that Alice does it. Now, Alice may not perform. She may not show up at the right time to take Bob to the airport. He misses his plane. She, he may beg off. Oh, no, Alice may beg off. Says she may beg off when she realizes how much heavy stuff Bob has to move. She may decide she doesn't want to study with Bob in economics. Bob can increase her motivation by offering a payment if she doesn't show up, or if she does show up, and demanding a penalty payment if she doesn't. Uh, this, there are other ways that Bob can motivate Alice by threatening her in the future that people won't deal with her for a while by saying, I'll tell my friends that you didn't, you know, you can't be trusted. And that, that's bad for Alice. It turns out though, that that's a dissipative punishment. It's also bad for society because now favors that were socially valuable don't get done. A penalty, the monetary payment, that's completely efficient. It's just an exchange of money between two people. As long as they're risk neutral, you know, that's the most efficient way to secure Alice's performance. But we rarely, if ever, see those kinds of penalties as imposed for these kind of social favors. And the Krebs and Stiglitz models give you the explanation. If Alice, if Bob demands that Alice pay a penalty, if she doesn't show up, that may change Alice's intrinsic motivation to do nice stuff for Bob. And that's, you know, Bob may be better off leaving Alice's intrinsic motivation alone and at best relying on dissipative punishment. Now, it's imposed, um, it's implied here that dissipative punishments do not affect her intrinsic motivation as much as monetary payments do, okay? I believe that's true. 
monetary payments make it seem like a market transaction. And that changes how Alice is going to frame this. Dissipative punishment, you can't be trusted, stuff like that. That's more in the nature of a social exchange. And so I don't have a model of this. I'm just assuming this is true. But I think that intrinsic motivation will be more preserved with the kind of dissipative punishment than it will with a monetary punishment. Now, we do see honoraria in some cases, uh, mostly directed, I think, at the participation constraint. Bob wants Alice to help him for an exam. He says, come over to my house, help me with the exam. We'll have pizza. Uh, Carol invites Greg to give the Arrow Lecture at Cal State Ukiah. There is no Cal State Ukiah, so I'm not slamming anybody here. To get anybody to go to Ukiah, you got to pay them something. Uh, and there's also an intrinsic motivation story about how honoraria go in the other direction. If Stiglitz offers me an honorarium, it could increase my sense of obligation to give a really good talk. Now, it doesn't work with a penalty. But with an honorarium, there's this countervailing story that one can tell, and in the book, I'll tell it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip this. A different plane, uh, Sam Bowles has a book about good citizenship with these kinds of things. Just give his quick argument. Good citizens feel an intrinsic responsibility to contribute to public goods and all sorts of other stuff, not to cheat on their taxes, not a lot of different things like that. You provide extrinsic incentives for citizens to do the right thing. It might adversely affect their intrinsic motivation to do the right thing. And so Sam's argument, we do a very good argument, is public policies aimed at extrinsically motivating citizens to do the right thing might be ineffective or even counterproductive. And I leave it to you to read his uh, very nice book. Okay, so that's sort of like step one in the progression I want to go through. Uh, what do I want to do? Well, so far, my intrinsic motivation is qualitatively aligned with Joe's. We both value that I appear. We both value that I give a high quality talk. But there are cases, especially in employment context, where my intrinsic motivation is different from what my employer wants me to do. I'm misaligned with my employer in terms of what my intrinsic motivation is. And if I just follow my intrinsic motivation, I may go do all sorts of stuff that the employer doesn't really want. The best way to achieve alignment in motivations is to have me internalize Joe's welfare, to put weight on how Joe feels about things. But how do you model such internalizations? How, you know, is there some axiomatic foundation for that? And then psychologists have very nice theories about how and when intrinsic interests, especially internalization of other people's welfare, grows or shrinks through time. I'd like to get this model or models of this thing to reflect those dynamic stories. OK, intrinsic incentive misalignment. I'll just give two real examples. High-tech startups, engineers want elegance. They want the best possible product coming out from the firm. Management wants to get a good enough product out. And there's some very interesting data by Baron Burton and Hannon and the Stafford Project on Emerging Companies that sort of says companies with a culture that, in, that, that, that recognizes uh, scientific excellence, they have a much harder time getting to IPO because the scientists following their intrinsic motivation are just trying too hard to get the perfect product rather than one that will go to market. Uh, primary nursing at Beth Israel Hospital, uh, it's a somewhat long story, but Beth Israel Hospital in the 1970s, late 1970s, found a way to motivate the senior RNs that was just killer based on self-determination theory, just killer. And then, but, but, but the consequence of this is, is that the senior RNs are probably over-prescribing for their patients. That's fine in fee-for-service, but year 2000 comes along, there's much more compensation to the hospital by capitation or diagnostic group, uh, resource group compensation. It no longer fits for nurses to over-prescribe and the hospital's got to decide, what do we do in the face of this now misalignment between the nurse's intrinsic motivation and our financial needs? Okay, I can skip that one. As I said, the best intrinsic motive incentive is one where the agent internalizes the welfare of the principal. Uh, what are the axiomatics of this? You, if you think about this hard, you think, okay, there's a fixed point problem. I incorporate Joe's interests in mine. Joe's incorporating my interests in his utility function. You know, as I put more weight on Joe, he's putting more weight on me, which is putting weight on him. 
you know, how do we get out of this fixed point version of this? I know how. And one of the things that the book's going to do, maybe the only original thing in the book, is using an Anscombe Oman mixture space approach. I can tell you how to axiomatize this without having to deal with the fixed point problem. It's not an ideal model. There are a lot of problems with this model, but it's workable. It lets you do some economics without having to deal with fixed points. And then dynamics. Uh, the things I'm interested in here are self-perception theory by um, Daryl Bim, social identity theory, mostly self-perception theory. And let me just skip over to what I have in mind here. This is just explaining what it is. It sets up the following virtuous cycle. Alice gets married to Pat. Alice, at the start of the marriage, is in the throes of romantic love. And she does favors for Pat, and she does them well because she loves Pat. According to self-perception theory, Alice does these favors and then sits and says, you know, why did I put myself out so much for Pat? She could explain it as, I'm in love with Pat. She could explain it with, I'm a generous person. She could explain it with, you know, I've got a contract with Pat and I have to fulfill the contract. If, whatever she decides, whatever she decides, that becomes more important to her going forward. If she says, I did it because I love Pat, she loves Pat even more. If she says, I did it to, to honor the contract, she says, the contract's really important to me. Well, if there's no contract, if we eliminate that possibility, if she concludes, I did it because I love Pat, she's more inclined in the future to act in this fashion, which strengthens the attitude again. And you get this very nice virtuous cycle of her degree of motivation for doing well by Pat. The amount of weight she puts in her own choices for Pat's utility is going to go up. If there's a contract, it might go down. Okay, and so now, if you see the manuscript right now, I don't have a model of this going on. It's not that hard to build a model like this. Uh, I really believe, at least in employment context, this is a very important phenomenon. That you have organizations which work very hard to get people to internalize the welfare of the organization by a whole bunch of different methods. You know, those are turn out to be fairly efficient organizations uh, with I. I got, there are some caveats, and again, you're going to have to read the book. Okay, so modeling this, just talk about modeling this. Yeah, that, just skip all this. Okay, I got 11 minutes for the big question. Is this something that economists should do? Is it good for the soul of economics as a discipline, or is it just badly interpreted and gussied up pop, pop psychology? Uh, if we do create and study such models, are we just reverse engineering conclusions with no gain in insight, right? Yeah, I swear to God, when I built those numerical models, I didn't try to rig them so that I'd get the striking results that I did get. Now, having created them, I now understand a little better how I really did reverse engineering things. I mean, it's not, you know, there are certain things that happened in those models that made those numbers come out as strongly as they did, but the general concern is people will just reverse engineer the conclusions they want to get to. Is anything gained by form formalizing things like self-perception processes beyond the obvious conclusions that if people care more about the welfare of other people, increasingly so, that's good for their relationship? Uh, I think the latter two questions, the only way to answer those questions is to try, is to start building models see where the analysis takes us. Uh, it says, I can point to one insight I've derived if time, I'm not gonna have time for that. Uh, in the book, I'll discuss uh, that insight and the data that support it, Never mind. Uh, yeah. But generally speaking, the answer to those two questions, is this just reverse engineering or are we gonna gain anything besides obvious conclusions? The only way to find out is to try the proof of the pudding can only come by eating in this case. The bigger question is, should we model this? Is this something that economists should be concerned about? Okay, go back in time, a little history of economic thought, recent economic thought. There was a time back in the 80s, let's say, when no co non-cooperative game theory had invaded the field of industrial organization. And it was, there were lots of models of entry deterrence and this and that and something else getting all sorts of fantastic conclusions. 
a traditional IO guy, Frank Fisher, hated every minute of it. So he wrote an article, Games Economists Play a Non-Cooperative View. Very nice article. Uh, he says, non-cooperative game theory is just bad juju for IO. It's backwards in engineering. Too many assumptions leading to conclusions that the author wanted. Proves nothing, teaches us nothing. As I said, simply bad juju. Uh, I'm on record uh, in publications and shortly in volume two of Microeconomic Foundations, I'm gonna even more strong, forcefully on record, Frank has a point. You know, his objections are right. Proving a proposition within a model is not the same as establishing a fact about the real world. And you better keep those two things separate. It illustrates a possibility, what Frank in the article calls exemplifying theorem. You've exemplified some possibility. You haven't proved that that possibility is right. You got to supplement it by common sense and better empirical evidence. And a lot of what's gone on using game theory to do some economic theorizing in IO and a whole bunch of other disciplines, common sense, let alone empirical evidence, is in very, very short supply. So is it good for the soul of economics? I think that if you look at non-cooperative game theory, what it's done to economics, if it's used with circumspection and common sense on net, on net, it's been a good thing for the discipline. But that if used with circumspection and common sense, that's essential. If you don't have that, it's big, it can be ridiculous stuff. What it does is it provides a framework for economics and it directs attention to important questions. So should we model this? I think so, as long as we employ circumspection and common sense. Uh, I'm on shaky ground in saying that, but I believe on net it will be good for the discipline. What I do, my other life besides being an economist is I teach or I have taught human resource management in, uh, to MBA students. It makes a lot of sense to them. It appeals to their common sense, some of the lessons that you learn from thinking in these terms. But only time and substantially more effort devoted to the subject by my fellow theorists. You know, there are really good people working on this stuff. You know, and Joe's writing a book about this. Uh, George Akerlof is great. Uh, Sam Bowles is great. I don't know Rachel Cranton. I've only read the one book by Rachel, but she's great based on that one book. But it takes, you know, the entire community, I think, of uh, microeconomic theorists ought to get themselves involved in thinking about where do preferences come from and how do they evolve. So thank you. And thanks once again to Ken Arrow, who taught us all that formal theory done well is essential to the discipline of economics. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am Alessandra Casella. I'm a professor of economics and political science here at Columbia, and I will be moderating the panel that will happen now with uh, comments on uh, Professor Krebs lecture. So uh, what should we do? Should we all sit there? The first panelist will be Professor Stiglitz. Uh, Professor Stiglitz really, really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll do it anyway. He's a professor of economics at Columbia. He's in fact a professor of everything at Columbia because he's a university professor. He is also a Nobel laureate, and he is Joe Stiglitz. Well, th thank you very much, David. And, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to comment on uh, uh, David's uh, Arrow Lecture for multiple reasons. Um, this is uh, the 13th Arrow Lecture, uh, and it's a long line of distinguished lectures following up uh, in one way or another on Kang's multiple seminal contributions. Uh, Arrow was uh, Columbia's most distinguished uh, PhD in economics. Uh, I hold him and his thesis up to our PhD students for what we expect uh, of all of our PhDs. So that's the, the, the base standard. Uh, not all of them have achieved that, I have to say. Um, this lecture was particularly, uh, has particular meaning for me because Ken was my, my teacher in the fall of 1964, a few years ago, at MIT. Uh, and uh, over the subsequent decades, uh, Ken Arrow and I became colleagues and good friends. On one occasion, he even entrusted me for, uh, with babysitting his goldfish. Uh, he was an intellectual mentor for me, and as he was for the entire profession. Uh, he changed the way we think and the way we uh, do economics. 
uh, he, he changed our preferences uh, to, uh, in many ways about what we think about what is good economics, and that was the question that David was asking at the, uh, at, at the end. Um, for years, Ken would come back to his alma mater for this lecture, sitting in the front row, often joined by his sons, David and Andi, a Andy, and sometimes by his wife, Selma. He always uh, had a yellow notepad in hand, and uh, the first and most insightful comment would come from Ken himself. And he continued to stun us with his brilliance, uh, as he had at the IM Triple S workshops that uh, David referred to in his manuscript. He, d he didn't talk about it today, but, but uh, uh, we all uh, at Stanford every summer sat around and, and uh, talked, uh, 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 commented on it on papers. It was a, a little bit of an intimidating thing for young economists, but uh, Ken's uh, comics were always brilliant. Uh, when I began my work in economics, it seemed that many of both the central conclusions and assumptions were suspect, including the conclusions concerning the efficiency of the market economy. The question I and my classmates, most importantly George Akerlof, asked each other was how to begin a reformulation in a conservative profession wedded to its assumptions and very slow to change. The assumptions in the first fundamental welfare theorem of fixed and exogenous preferences and technologies, fixed beliefs, um, uh, and perfect or at least exogenous and non-asymmetric non information all seem crucial. While the assumption of fixed preferences was obviously, to me at least, the most glaring deficiency, it was, both the, it was the hardest to fix. Becker and Stigler and others might make, made it clear that any attempt to do so would encounter enormous resistance. Uh, they wrote a paper uh, with the, uh, you know, tastes are not to be uh, disputed, um, and uh, it seemed obvious that information was imperfect and exogenous, and that there were already insights from statistics that would help us develop mathematical formalizations that would make the new ideas more acceptable. I should add, even then we encountered enormous resistance uh, from uh, the leading journals. I don't, uh, George Akerlof is not uh, 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 giving away secrets. I think he's written that uh, uh, his famous Lemmings paper was uh, rejected three times before it was finally accepted at the QJE, which should give uh, a little bit of encouragement to uh, uh, those of you uh, who write papers and find them rejected, that uh, it, it, it does happen. It may, it's not a sign that it's going to be a path-breaking paper, but it's not inconsistent with it being a path-breaking paper. One of the things about Ken that was most impressive was that not only had he established the sense in which and the conditions under which Adam Smith's invisible hand uh, conjecture was correct, he went on to think more deeply about the real world implications. Contrary to Chicago school economists who thought uh, he and DeBru had established the efficiency of the market, he realized he had really proved that markets were not in general efficient. Uh, and this goes back to you know, when we prove a theorem, it's just a theorem. The question is what is the connection between the theorem and the world? And uh, people reading the first fundamental theorem in Chicago, for some reason, came to the conclusion it proved that the markets were efficient. Uh, and when I read it, I thought it proved that markets were not efficient because the conditions uh, were almost surely never satisfied. But what was uh, distinctive about Ken was that he went on to explore uh, ideas like moral hazard, adverse selection, endogenous technology, and even endogenous preferences and institutional responses to market failures. I'll say a little bit about those later. And how they might affect the efficiency of the economy. It became increasingly clear that the sufficient uh, conditions for efficiency that he had established were close to necessary conditions. Well, the big breakthrough in the 1970s and 80s of behavioral economics undermined assumptions of full rationality those developments were based on the recognition of cognitive limitations, thinking fast versus thinking slow, and brought insights from psychology into economics. 
By contrast, uh, the lecture here and work by a number of other scholars in the last two decades um, focuses on preference formation and is influenced more by sociology and social psychologists, including some of those cited by Krebs. It's not a matter of thinking fast or slow. The problems David talks about, marriage, giving blood, giving a lecture, are not the result of fast thinking. Uh, the parties to these discussions deliberate slowly. You know, uh, you don't solve those problems that David, uh, 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 solve those game theory problems that he solves uh, over uh, in, in just a second. It, it takes a little few more seconds than that. And so they deliberate sl slowly aware that behavior is more complex and different from that hypothesized in the standard economist model and in ways that matter deeply, at least for key relationships, not just marriage, but in labor and credit markets. Uh, and David talked about labor markets. I'll give an example a little bit later on about credit markets. The Harvard uh, philosopher Michael Sandel in his very entertaining book, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets, provides many examples besides those provided by David, where what might be termed marketization changes the nature of the economic exchange and relationship, where market norms can crowd out valuable non-market behavior, what, what uh, ex extrinsic rewards uh, crowding out intrinsic. And I think that's really an important idea and needs to be modeled. Uh, and I think uh, what David here has done is a, 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 an important beginning. I'm not sure that the literature provides an adequate taxonomy of the various channels through which the effects are exercised and the ways in which this kind of analysis is differentiated from the individualistic analysis which has been at the center of economics. But the careful reasoning provided by Krebs is an important step forward helping us to think more rigorously how we can best integrate other regarding behavior in individual decision making. Along the way, what David says has much to say about currently fashionable tradi traditions in say mac uh, macroeconomics, uh, although he didn't, may not uh, have uh, uh, explicitly said that. As I have also emphasized, there's a marked uh, difference between choices between red and green lettuce, choices which may, we make repeatedly and on the basis of which, using the theory of revealed preferences, we can construct a preference ordering, a uh, utility function, and a uh, difference between that and lifetime choices. We live only once. We don't know how we will feel in the future unless we believe in a reincarnation. We can't rerun the experiment. Uh, I wish I had saved, uh, uh, individuals can reason, I wish I had saved more or less and my lifetime utility would accordingly have been larger or smaller. Um, the economist model is not only deficient in the assumption of fixed preferences, but in its assumption that we know what will make us uh, happy or well off. The key aspect emphasized and modeled by David is that intrinsic rewards uh, of other regarding behavior may be attenuated by contractual terms. He uses this as at least a partial explanation of why we don't see punishments in certain contexts where in the standard framework they would be required to achieve efficient outcomes. Um, he emphasizes that the utility individual gets and uh, his or her behavior is affected by the contractual relationship in which the individual is be embedded. That is very much in the spirit of Carl uh, Polanyi who argued in a seminal book on the great transformation uh, he argued that markets are embedded in politics and society, and the design of market arrangement has to reflect that. And I'll say that a little bit more about that later. In the remaining time, I want to turn to three central issues posed by the endogeneity and inter interdependence of preferences and behavior. The first is uh, concerns alternative conceptions of preferences. Adam Smith, in his theory of moral sentiments, recognizes recognize that other regarding uh, nature of human beings and the importance of it for behavior. It has taken a uh, long time for economists to begin to formalize what this implies, and Krebs' lecture will, I believe, be a fundamental contribution to this literature. But Krebs also begins an inquiry into changes in preferences. The preferences are changing and can be changed, at least to some extent, is obvious. Parents spend enormous efforts trying to shape their children. 
Those in, the mar uh, those in marketing and corporations believe that the billions of dollars they spend affects consumer behavior. Those in HR and corporations believe that team building and corporate culture can affect behavior every bit as much or more than monetary incentives and in many ways more efficiently. That was the idea of trying to get your utility functions aligned so that they do what you want them to do uh, in the circumstances where, uh, you know, it goes back to the necessity of delegation. You, you can't do everything. The principal can't do everything. And the question is, the literature until now has focused, for the most part, on getting incentives for them to do. The principal gives incentives to the, for them to do what you want. And the alternative that uh, begun to be discussed by uh, Ackerhoff and Crampton is to get their preferences aligned, to get their identity aligned. And um, uh, so that's really important. Uh, there's a long literature on changing preferences, including habit formation. Uh, there are difficult issues about commitment and foresight. To what extent can individuals, knowing that their preferences tomorrow will be different, commit, commit themselves to behave according to their current preferences? How do and should, though I'm not sure I know what the word should means here, individuals behave? There is one strand of work in which individuals have a meta-utility function and choose a utility function next period to maximize the meta-utility function. That was a little bit the some of the stuff that Benabu and some others have done. That approach is comfortable to economists uh, because it, it's all about choosing something to maximize something else. Uh, we, that's what we do all the time. But I think it misses a key aspect of endogenous preferences. The extent to which what we experience and how we respond to those experiences is out of our control. I'm attracted more to an approach more common in psychology where there are multiple identities, preferences, and which is expressed is largely determined by context. The banker who acts less selfishly after going to church on Sunday than he does during the week is not doing so consciously but as a result of the context which he, in which he has uh, been moved out of a world in which the money metric dominates um, into a world in which social welfare dominates. He, of course, has put himself into that context, but I am unconvinced that, he, that as he alternates between these differing selves, he is doing so in ways which could convincingly be shown to reflect some underlying meta-preference. That this is so is a strong assumption and yet to be tested. There's an alternative way of putting some of this, perhaps more in the standard formulation. Individuals have preferences over framed options. The frame depends not only on context, for instance, the penalty option that Krebs would have uh, if, he, there were, uh, if, if he were a no-show, but also on cultural representations. The lens to which we see the world is crucial and those lenses are largely culturally determined. Perception, uh, how we see the world, is a construction. The categories, prototypes, images, narratives, and other mental structures that a person has in mind mediate his perceptions and affect uh, what he believes and therefore uh, how he behaves. So that's the first set of issues. And now I want to come to the second issue, which is the determinants of preferences a central tenet of more recent work on endogenous and interdependent preferences is that those preferences are affected by be the behavior of others, by history and culture. We don't choose where we are born and where we grew up, uh, which are central determinants of our behavior. But while we are affected by society at large, we are collectively society at large. There is a new evolutionary process, and in simple models, we can even describe a Nash equilibrium. And that, in a way, is one of the, you know, when, when uh, David was asking, what can economists bring to this? I think part of my view is that uh, sociologists don't think in equilibrium, uh, so social equilibrium terms. And that is part of the DNA of economists, looking at interactions and how A affects B and B affects C and C affects A. So that, I think, is something that we, you know, as to say, we, the proof is in the pudding, as David said, but I think we have a mindset 
where I think there is a real potential for us to make a contribution in this area. And finally, let me um, come to uh, uh, the importance of these effects uh, and the big question that uh, David asked, uh, should we model this? And uh, unambiguously, uh, from my perspective, the answer is yes. If preferences are endogenous, and if we can systematically understand the dynamics of preference change, then it offers a new set of tools, a new set of insights into why certain policies have failed. Uh, now, I've been very sensitive about this because uh, where, the way I got into this is partly f through development economics, where uh, development is about modernization, and modernization is about changing preferences. And if you go back to Weber, it was talked about the capitalist, uh, the Protestant ethic. Uh, so in, in that sense, there's been a long tradition of trying to think about these things, and I think it's actually helped us think about it. Uh, the World Bank's uh, 2015 D uh, World Development Report called Mind, Society, and Behavior provided glimpses into the beginning of that agenda. Consider microcredit, uh, 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 looking at the, this, these ideas from the capital market. Microcredit, as many of you know, is one of the important developmental innovations of the latter part of the 20th uh, century. There were numerous RCTs trying to perfect the microcredit loan contract, uh, doing what uh, Becker would have done. Uh, you know, how do I tweak the, uh, get the best loan contract? And they did a lot of experiments to try to get uh, better contracts along the lines uh, of uh, Becker's idea that every marriage needs a prenup. But then came the enormous failure of the largest microcredit uh, scheme uh, in India. Uh, some of you may know about that. To many of us, including uh, Muhammad Yunus, I talked to him about this, who was the founder of the first microcredit institution, the Grameen Bank, it did not come as a surprise. SK was a for-profit lender, and having a pro-profit lender totally changed the relationship between the lender and the borrower. And so this was a case where it wasn't the contract, it was the perception about who was on the other side of the contract and what was he doing for me. So it was, you know, I hadn't bought the wife, I hadn't, you know, it was, uh, this was, a, a non-profit, the Grameen Bank, and SK, uh, the Indian company, uh, was, was a for-profit lender. And that totally changed the dynamic between the borrower and the lender. Uh, it changed the intrinsic reward associated with repaying the lo loan. So my uh, unambiguous answer for me uh, uh, to the question that David asked us, should we model this, is yes. There is a growing body of literature on how history, culture, and those around us shape preferences. Uh, I made a first attempt uh, to model historical and cultural effects on behavior in a paper I wrote with uh, Carol Hoff uh, back uh, about five years ago. I think this is a key frontier of economics because it helps explain social change, divergent paths of development, and so societal rigidities. Ken, Ken would have given a similar answer. Indeed, um, you know, I think all of us, as we uh, look and uh, th think about Ken's work, do a little Google searching and fi discover uh, th articles that uh, have not entered into the uh, uh, main economic uh, agenda. And he wrote an article in 2010 on the economy of trust. Uh, although uh, he, he gave a seminar at, at the World Bank on that subject uh, 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 10 years earlier. And he published this in uh, a, a, a journal uh, called Religion and Liberty. And uh, uh, which is, you know, those of you who knew, knew Ken knew that he had interest in everything and, and was uh, uh, really uh, uh, involved in everything. So anyway, he wrote, uh, in that article, I believe that sociology should play more of a role in economics than it does. The way people behave in economics is partly influenced by how other people behave. So it is really this interaction among people that he called attention to. There is, of course, much more to be said on each of these topics. Ken would have been enormously pleased with this lecture. 
he would have had much to say. I can only thank David once again for this thoughtful and stimulating lecture. Thank you very much, Joe. Had I been a really strict moderator, I would have tried to keep you to a shorter time. But what you were saying was so interesting that I lost track of where we were. Uh, our next panelist uh, is uh, Professor Naidu, Suresh Naidu. Uh, professor Naidu is professor in economics and international and public affairs here at Columbia. OK, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, David, for these, uh, uh, these very stimulating lectures and slides. Um, so I want to start, I mean, I'm like, why am I being asked to, to discuss on this as a as a much more applied researcher? And I realized sort of afterwards, partly because probably that I have this like strange heterodox background. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, I'll just tell, give like a counterpoint to, uh, uh, in some sense, you know, uh, how do we get to, you know, the Akerlof and Cranton or, you know, versions of reciprocity is that we often wind up having to do these exotic utility functions where our utility functions depend on the payoffs of other people. And then you have to wonder yourself, well, why those utility functions? Why, where did those come from? And one of the things that sort of comes out of this, this, this um, sort of strange, you know, evolutionary uh, 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 parts of things is that actually underneath it, there's actually, uh, there's a long run economics behind why we have the, the, the sort of strange uh, utility functions that we that we have. And that's maybe helpful for sort of saving us in some sense, because when you think of like an applied uh, economist, like what are the things that we do? Well, we actually, a lot of the reason I think we're paid more than sociologists is because we're willing to ignore all of the things that sociologists take seriously and say, oh yeah, yeah, we'll give you a dollar equivalent for that, you know, deadweight loss and say, and back out from revealed preferences of individuals willing to say things about how much people value stuff. But if you're in a world where preferences are like indeterminate, subject to context, a lot of this stuff, you can't, you don't get to do that anymore. And so your ability to say like, oh, we've got a welfare maximizing thing just is a lot harder. And you can, you, I think, you know, there's a lot of theorists that have made progress on this with the cognitive sort of thing. So like if you're making decisions uh, with, with mistakes, uh, we can fix that. We can look at the subset over which you do have well-defined preferences over. But when you have preferences over what other people are getting, that's a that's a trickier problem uh, 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 to solve, and so then I sort of want to say like, well, what what do economists have to add to this? Once you so a we can put material payoffs underneath the 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 preferences that that we get, and then I think we actually have a really nice device, and this is something again that a few linguists and uh, 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 and biologists have sort of thought about, which is that that the right tool for thinking about where norms come from is correlated equilibria with the idea that there's like events or signals in the world that sort of set people's common expectations about how everyone's gonna play. And that that's a much like, much like lighter weight cognitive structure for actually how people behave in the world than the apparatus of like, I know that you know that I know that you know that sort of standard Nash equilibrium is based on. And so I wanna make a pitch in favor of correlated equilibrium as a device for thinking about endogenous preferences and things in, in, in modeling people in the wild. Of course, this is not the only way we use theory. It's like, you know, IO models firms in the wilds. Market design, I feel like, is all about sort of domesticating the environment so you don't have to think about people in the wild. And, uh, and then when I sort of see what, what my, my colleagues in CS are doing with mechanism design, it's like, often it's like the right apparatus for this is designing environments for, for, for AIs to interact, for example. So, but, but I think for, for behavioral econ, it's, um, uh, this is, you know, it's, uh, it's useful to get something simple. Um, and I just want to say, like, once we throw out choice coherence, we lose warp, like, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and that means that we don't, even things like price indices wind up being a little bit more problematic because you have to weight the price index by the expenditure shares evaluated around a utility point. And so once you have that people's preferences are dependent on every, what other people are getting, that ability to sort of say that somebody's welfare has fallen because the prices have gone up. That's probably true, but it's also going to depend on the expenditure shares of everybody else um, that, you, that you're, you're involved in. And so some very basic things that we, so do we even have an inflation problem? I mean, maybe, that, uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, maybe the preferences, and this comes up in economic history when you're trying to construct price indices over like 500 years. Yeah, what, how much did people like mill it? I don't know. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, uh, and so, you know, and so then I think what's what's useful 
to bring it back is then to put material fundamentals underneath where these where these utility functions and so these these inconsistencies where where people have the simple utility over their own consumption and leisure maybe these are optimal solutions to other problems so fundamental uncertainty leading to like bandit problems so we can't solve these things at least the heuristics i know uh, David's worked on that. And just like path dependent pledges from prestige based imitation. So you start in one place and you just are always doing these little local optima the way that, you know, dolphins get fins and stuff. And it's just not necessarily guaranteed any sort of global optimum. But, but, you know, maybe they're maybe, but maybe they're at least Nash equilibrium in some form. So I just wanted to sketch sort of the, I think this is implicit in David's lecture, but I was just like to make sense for myself was like, what, what are people getting? So it's like, you know, Stiglitz can choose two contracts. He can choose to trust that David will do a good job and not not pay a not 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 make a uh, incentive based contract, or he can offer incentives. And Krebs can either kind of play in the mode of having this social preferences where he's doing things because you know he feels obligated or is uh, uh, thinking thinking civilly, or he can think about uh, in playing like uh, like with, with selfish preferences. And if he pays with social preferences and Stiglitz trusts him, then he'll do a good job. He'll show up. If he plays social preferences, but Stiglitz offers incentives, he'll actually be really mad. And uh, and and so I think more than just saying that uh, that you know he he his intrinsic motivation will go down, I think it's actually that he will get some value from like actually hurting Joe. <laughs> Uh, and it, like that, that, and I think that idea that there's a negative side of, of it's not just that you're reducing intrinsic incentives, it's that you create incentives for spite and harming the other side is actually another part of the social preferences that we're less willing to talk about because it involves like l l literally being willing to like take take some pleasure in hurting someone else, and uh, uh, and that's like the dark side of social preferences. Um, and of course, if you do selfish preferences, you're not going to get nearly as good an outcome in terms of like the low, the, the low effort thing, but at least you can guarantee that uh, no one's no one's made angry. Um, and so I think, you know, in this sort of game that I sketched, you know, these these two equilibria, one is social preferences and trust, and the other one is incentives and selfish preferences, and you can pick one of those two. Um, and then this is sort of, uh, you know, one of the some evidence from this. So I think Ernst Fair has a number of papers that you probably know about, but I like this one where they basically show that when you offer incentive contracts, you don't get that much more incentives, uh, that much more effort than when you offer trust contracts. But one of the interesting things, if you offer a trust contract, but you give the option of a bonus, so not a guaranteed honoraria, but like if Joe really likes what you did, you can then give the honoraria, you'll actually get even a better outcome because this chance of Joe rewarding you is like a is, is the thing that makes you want to do even better. And so the honoraria being contingent is important for it to work, to, to not credit out the, 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 uh, um, the incentive. Um, so, so then I think like what, what we get from this is like, you know, we get what correlated equilibria help you do is figure out which equilibrium to play. So when you offer cash or offer the, the contract, you get people to play in this like self-interested complete contract, you know, uh, part of the space. But if you don't offer cash, if you instead cue their, their, their sense of solidarity or something else, you get people to play like the social uh, and incomplete contract. And so we can then start talking about all the cultural cues that we have that become communicators of which thing that you, which, which world are you in? And then that's kind of a very rich empirical agenda, which is like, when is cash just cash? And when is in fact like kind of destroying this other social context and pushing you out? And so we all know about the Israeli daycares, but there's also plenty of times when just cash just works like cash. So I'll give you the example of playing for plastic bags, where you know people had some environmental incentive to just bring their own bags, but they didn't. And then you like started charging people for plastic bags, and they started bringing their own bags. And there wasn't a crowding out of a social context; it just literally worked like a price. And so, what are the contexts? What's the cultural content of contexts where we uh, where cash? does do the crowd out and when it doesn't, I feel like that's kind of a very interesting uh, uh, empirical agenda. And I'll leave it at that. I will, uh, I will conclude by making just two very small comments of my own. And the two, the two comments are related, are also related to things that of course, both uh, Suresh and Ken and, uh, and Joe already said. Um, David Krebs talk really talks about individual choices. But I think we can very easily extend uh, what you're looking at to social choices and very much in the spirit of Canara. 
So there is a literature uh, at the boundary, again, with social psychology that makes the claim that democratically decided policies, for example, have higher legitimacy and hence higher compliance. And this is for given policies and for given payoffs. So the examples that people will give, for example, would be uh, Swiss cantons that have more referenda also have lower tax evasion. Or firms where workers are more involved in decision making have higher productivity. The problem with these examples is that there is a self-selection problem, right? The samples are not constant, and so the examples are, I mean, are interesting examples, but they are not proving anything. And this is where experiments really can come in, because keeping the sample constant in the real world is difficult, since these choices are endogenous, the choices of institutions are endogenous. And so um, among the literature, two papers of this type that I like very much and I would like to mention are two papers by Pedro Dalbo with Andrew Foster and other co-authors who use an experiment exactly to study that. So in, uh, in the simplest experiment, think of participants to an experiment that have to solve some tasks. They have to execute some tasks, say, adding numbers, adding random numbers. And they can be paid with a fixed pay, with a fixed rate, or they can be paid a piece rate, depending on the number of numbers that uh, they add. And the choice of whether to have a fixed rate or a piece rate can either be made democratically by them or can be made randomly by a computer. And the question, the experimental question is, conditional on having the piece rate, is productivity higher when the rate has been chosen by the group as opposed to being uh, imposed by the outside. So it's very nice, it's very clean. I'm sorry to say the answer is no. <laughs> Productivity is not higher. Uh, although there is a second paper which is less clean, uh, but it's a nice paper in AR in 2010 where the answer they find to a different experiment is yes. So I think that we can conclude that we don't know. Um, which is not a bad conclusion for us. It means there is work to be done. And it's, it's an interesting question that we could look into. And then I have a second point, and the second point is again related to the idea that context is really socially interpreted. And that is very important. And so I am not sure I'm ready to really dismiss Becker's line on the premarital contract that if really detailed premarital contracts became the norm, then the signaling impact of the contract would disappear, including the self-signaling. So I think that's true. But I would like to give you another example, if I may, and I will copy David Krebs' rhetorical device of using real names and using imaginary anecdotes. So in my imaginary anecdote, uh, here at Columbia, we are working to organize the Arrow Lecture, and we're very happy because it's shaping up really well. But we realized two weeks before the lecture that we have a serious problem. We don't have a single woman on the podium. And this is a concern, and so we invite Alessandra Casella, AEC, to participate. Now, AEC is very happy to participate because it's the Arrow Lecture, and of course she admires Caneros very much because the speaker is excellent, because the topic is very interesting, because the panel is very impressive. However, things are not so simple because the invitation makes focal one identity of AC, which is woman, which is not the identity that should be focal in this circumstance. And remember from what we heard that this could affect the long-term self-image that the AC develops. So the situation is complicated. On the other hand, it's also very important that young women and young men see more and more women on the podium, and AC believes that, and thinks that there is a norm here that can be affected and can move. And hopefully, if this happens more and more, the norm will change. And then the two identities will not clash any longer. It will be a completely trivial problem. So I think it's important that we realize that these norms are socially constructed, that the identities are socially constructed. 
And it's particularly socially constructed which of these various complex identities that we all have becomes a salient identity in a given situation. And so I think that it will be wonderful to see the research moving in a dynamic sense, but also recognizing this, which is probably related to Suresh correlated equilibrium, right? You see the woman on the podium and it acts as a coordinated device to move the equilibrium to a, a different social point. So thank you very much. Not a lot to say. I mean, they were excellent comments and I agree with almost everything. Trying to see what I would say in response. Um, two minor things, which are more in the nature of entertainment. Uh, Joe mentioned the paper by Becker and Stigler, De Gustavus non est disputandum. They put the est in the wrong place. Uh, that's a wrong paper. They prove a theorem that's not true. And Joe, if you're interested, I'll explain it later on. That's just more, okay. Uh, the, there was a point somebody, I was, oh, it was Shuresh, who said that, you know, an unexpected uh, reward, or a reward that is, you know, not contingent, can have a powerful motivating effect. Um, I assume that Sandy Grossman is not in the audience, so I can tell a Sandy Grossman story. It is alleged, and I think with good reason, that if you went to give a seminar at the University of Pennsylvania, at the end of the seminar, people would go out to dinner, and the table would buy a bottle of wine, and Sandy would buy a different bottle of wine for Sandy. And if he really liked the talk, the speaker got a glass. Now, I believe this, I have heard the story from enough people, so I believe it's true. That's an example of an unexpected payment, which I think probably motivated people to try a little harder at their seminar. <laughs> okay. Um, the only other thing I want to say is, you know, uh, Suresh brought up the example of paying for plastic bags changed behavior. And I read into what he said the implication was is that people began to bring their little, you know, cloth bags and things like that because of the economic cost. I don't believe that for a second. At least in California, those plastic bags cost five cents a piece. The cost of going to find your cloth bags and bringing them, much more than five cents. What I think motivated people who brought the cloth bags is they just resented the fact that previously, Paper bags or plastic bags or whatever were free. And now these, you'll excuse the expression, bastards are making me pay for them. I refuse to do that. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure about the, the economic motivation uh, working there. Um, yeah, that, that's all. I, I, I have a whole bunch of other comments, but I'll save them for the, for the three discussions.